Rob, walk us through the story behind Pax8, the journey to where we are right now. Sure. Uh, it's been a roller coaster journey, like I think a lot of startups experience. Uh, Pax8 always had a very clear vision from the very beginning, uh, founded by a guy called John Street. And this was this idea that essentially cloud software should be as easy for organizations to buy as it is to install a mobile app on a phone. So this idea of you know the, the iTunes marketplace for cloud apps was kind of where it all began. And um, John and his co-founder Klaus kind of came up with this concept. And at the beginning, everybody thought they were kind of crazy. Um, they had real trouble getting funding at the beginning because the model just didn't look very attractive. And so, um, you know, they were fortunate to have had a number of previous business successes. So they were able to fund it themselves, sort of, you know, sc scrabble around and raise a bit of angel investment. And uh, the first sort of three or four years of the business was very challenging. Uh, and then they just got that point of inflection and scale really started to kick in. And then suddenly everybody wanted a piece of it. Right. And so, um, you know, the journey of Pax8 was kind of a slow start and then an absolute rocket ship. And uh, it's probably probably the fifth year as we sit here today since that, you know, that trans sort of trajectory change really took place. Uh, which is, has been marked by our inclusion in the Inc. 5000, which is the far, you know 500 fastest growing companies in the US that are still privately held. So uh, yeah, a, a hell of a journey, just getting started really, um, and you know disrupting a trillion dollar industry along the way. And you've been a part of uh, Pax8 for how long now? So personally, I've been part of Pax8 for about two years. Um, I was previously the founder and CEO of a business called Wirehive, which was acquired by Pax8 as a, the beginning of international expansion. So, um, you know, we're filming today in what was Wirehive's office, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we spent sort of eight or nine years building a technology business in the UK that Pax8 saw as a great, a great way to kind of begin the international expansion. And we've gone on to acquire five or six other companies across Europe and now in Asia Pacific and New Zealand as well. Um, so yeah, my journey with Pax8 has been about two years and, uh, you know, when we started in the UK, we had about 30 people. Uh, we've got about 250 people today and it's, you know, that was about 18 months ago. So um, yeah, the growth has been pretty spectacular. Humbling experience from so few employees to where you are today. Yeah, Must absolutely. make you extremely proud to be a part of that journey as well. Yeah, definitely proud. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot to be proud of at Pax8. It's a really genuinely special organization. And I'm sure lots of people you interview say things like that, but um, it's actually true on this occasion. Um, you know, we've, I think that there's so many things you could point to, obviously revenue growth, raising a series F from SoftBank, who are sort of, you know, the seen by many as the kind of rock star venture capitalist. Um, you know, achieving that unicorn status of $1.7 billion pre-money valuation on that round. You know, those are all the kind of traditional ways people get excited about businesses, I guess. But I think for those of us that are part of it, it's actually seeing the progress that we're creating for the people that are part of Pax8 that's almost more rewarding. Um, you know, the, we measure things like the employee mobility rate within the company, how often people get a promotion within a 12 month period. and. Um, you know, our whole model is is designed around largely hiring young, fairly inexperienced talent and offering incredible career development opportunity. And, you know, to see that happen at the speed it is, I think, is is truly humbling and, and is really gets you out of bed in the morning. So amazing. Yeah. Well, we're going to go into this in depth um, in terms of the business. Obviously, you need great people to work here. And Chloe, what I want to find out from you is, you know, you've got a really fun spin here on the company values that you've curated. Talk me through exactly what these are and tell me why they're so important to the organization to thrive as a, you know, a purpose-driven culture. Yeah, we have four core values. Uh, they are innovate, advocate, elevate, and celebrate. And uh, the eagle listeners among you will know they all end in eight. <laughs> and so we represent them with the, the figure eight. Um, Number eight is very special to us at Pax8. Um, but what they really do embody, as well as uh, sort of being very conveniently uh, suffixed, is that drive to constantly push ourselves and the product to better serve our partners and our colleagues. Uh, so obviously innovation is at the heart, the idea that Klaus and John came up with that distribution was broken and that what cloud technology needed was the app store. Um, the elevation piece, as Rob sort of already mentioned, 
we really believe on promoting from win high and great people get out of the way and just give them the resources to see them absolutely fly. Uh, advocate is all about not just advocating for our partners. Our partners are the hero of our journey. They're who we're here to serve, but advocating for each other you know, as a community. And last but not least, and really for me, the most important one is celebrate. And that is about celebrating each other's individuals, like really celebrating the diverse pool of people who work at Pax8 and the fact that they come to the work as themselves every single day, uh, but also celebrating the milestones. We have a lot of success here. I've never been at a place that wins as much as Pax8 does, um, but we grow really fast. And so it's really important that we embed that notion of stopping and looking back and celebrating those milestones. Otherwise, it could just be too fast, too much and lead to burnout. Okay, so celebrate is your favourite. It is. Value. What about yours, Debbie? What one do you resonate with most? I have to choose between innovate and advocate. I guess on the advocate side, I just watch so many people prop each other. We call them props. It's, it's really recognition, sound bites. It's open to the whole country company to kind of see and share. And I just love the fact that everybody around the organisation whether you're at your first entry level role with CGS, you can give your colleagues recognition for what they've done for you and your colleagues give you recognition for what you've done for them. So there's a whole lot of gratitude around the organization for what people kind of achieve um, and innovate because I'm a bit of a maverick and it's just like most people join this company because they want to disrupt. They've been in, some of them have been in other corporate organizations where they know things can be done better and they want to disrupt it, they want to do things differently. And I think that's what draws people into us. Perfect. And what about yourself, Rob? Oh, I don't know. They're all, they all have a really important place, I think. Um, I think the, you know, the comments of my uh, learned friends here are, are spot on, but I, I think any technology company ultimately lives or dies by the quality of its product. And I think innovation is such a key part of that. And for Pax8, innovation wasn't just about the, the, you know, the product itself and how we went to market with it, but it was how people were part of that product. And that's something that I think a lot of um, our competitors, we almost don't consider them competitors because we feel we're so different in our approach to the others in our market. But people and analysts we call our competitors just don't have that same vision for why people are such an intrinsic part of what makes a technology business successful. Um, so I think innovation, not just of the tech itself, but of the whole thesis of what building a technology business is, is the thing that I really connect. Fantastic. Well, um, in terms of innovate, um, you've been innovating, I suppose, your profession um, and the role that you're in right now is very, very different to the role that you served what, just a couple of years ago where you were the EMEA CEO. So now you're Global Chief People Officer. Walk me through, how has that transition been for you, you know, to go from a CEO to a Chief People Officer? Yeah, role? I mean, it's been, so as we sit here today, it's been about three months since I made that change. And um, it's been very rewarding, but certainly challenging as well. And I think it's unusual to have someone make that leap. Um, as so many people love to tell me, oh, that's unusual. Like, yeah, it is, I suppose. Um, I think that I spent 10 years getting really good at being a CEO, right? I, pra I practiced my craft and got to a point where I was pretty good at it. And to step away from that was a, was a, you know, some people would probably consider that to be a bit of a strange decision. But I think what I realized um, as we were going through the discussions about the opportunity was CEOs or heads of business, whatever the title, but are generalists, right? By definition, you have to be quite good at lots of stuff, but you also have something you're really exceptional at. And I'm from a technology background, so I always assumed that was my thing. And I think what I realized as we went through this process was actually along the journey, it had become people and culture and, you know, creating an environment where people can do their best work and the stuff that I consider to be the bread and butter of, you know, a modern people organization. Um, so as we talked about it more and more, it became clear, actually, I could really make a difference to this part of Pax8 um, and the opportunity to, to impact not just the 300 people we have in EMEA, but the 1400 people we have globally. And depending on when you listen to this, it may be considerably more than that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think was something I just couldn't, you know, couldn't 
turn away from. So um, yeah, it's been an exciting transition and one I'm really enjoying, but I definitely think it's not a road that's particularly well traveled by others. You're exactly right. I think the only other example I can give you is Ogilvy's CEO, who then took on a global chief people officer role. Yeah. But other than that, few and far between. I mean, one of our re other episodes that we did with Lego, uh, Lauren Schuster, their current chief people officer, had never ever done a day's work in HR per se um, up until we took that role. He was working in marketing and in sales, business development. So quite interesting to now see sort of a new breed of chief people officer, perhaps not with the necessary sort of experience in HR, but have probably acquired it indirectly yeah. through the other business functions. And I suspect we'll see more of that. And I, know, I don't mean that in a you know, to disparage the craft of HR, I think it remains, you know, what people traditionally thought of as HR, which I think is the more transactional side of it, in my opinion, remains a, a critical part. But for me, that's just sort of like the hygiene of a people org. It's, it's the more progressive approach to what people and culture really means in a business that is the future state for HR, I think. And um, I think as a result, we're going to see more and more people enter people leadership roles from alternative backgrounds. I don't think that more traditional kind of HR pathway will be as common as it perhaps once was. Um, that's my prediction anyway. I completely agree. When you look at employer brands, we're seeing a whole host of marketeers now come into the HR function. Yeah. I know that that's also your background yeah. as well, Chloe, right? Yeah, 10 years B2B marketing uh, before I made the transition. And yeah, like Rob, I again, I thought marketing was my craft. And as we grew the Wahai business, um, took a more generalist sort of day-to-day uh, -day leadership role. And I realized that what I loved the most was seeing people develop um, and helping them realize their full potential um, and making work a place of joy. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I made the move. Extremely satisfying. Rob, maybe, maybe just taking some practical advice yeah. with what you've learned over the last few months taking on this role. What would you say has been the biggest challenge as a global chief people officer? And then maybe to flip it more in a positive light, what are you sort of, you know, most grateful for, what are most appreciative of, um, you know, having a role that impacts so many people? I mean, a challenge can be positive too. Uh, <laughs> um, what's the greatest challenge been? I think right now, a lot of our challenges at Paxe are what people describe as good problems to have, although it never quite feels like that when you're dealing with them, right? But um, I think growth is where a lot of our friction comes from um, you know we what does that mean it means attracting amazing talent to fill all the open roles we have it, even in a market like we have today that's continuously been a challenge for us i think um you know making sure that everybody who goes through the talent pipeline has an amazing experience whether they do or they don't end up at pax eight right things like that when you've just got the the, the sheer volume of you know, conversations going on, right, is a really big challenge. I think that's an area that I've been really focused on. Um, leadership is probably the thing that really stands out. If I had to pick one thing, though, which is we've got, because of the velocity of Pax and our approach in terms of hiring young people and giving them the opportunity, we've got lots of very uh, green leaders in the business, people who are early in their careers who have amazing potential, but don't have much experience. And so, um, you know, in some cases in our business, I think it's a little bit of the blind leading the blind. And um, everybody, <clears throat> everybody's very well intended, you know, trying really hard to do great work and support each other. And But experience is so valuable. And I think sometimes we, we have a bit of a lack of that across the organization. And so that's something that I've been really focused on trying to um, solve, I guess, like, you know, helping bring in great external facilitation, different methods and um, things like the 15 commitments of conscious leadership and, you know, radical candor and all the kind of like vaguely cutting edge, I suppose, leadership thinking around how you show up and create great culture and nurture people and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, leadership has been a real area of focus. And what was the second question? What do I find most rewarding? Yeah. I find that all that rewarding. So maybe I answered <laughs> one, but um, what do I find rewarding? I guess um, seeing the impact immediately is very rewarding like you know i'm three months into the role and i can already see meaningful change happening as a result of some things that i've been able to do and so you know what i suppose that's the joy of scale like we're not a huge business but we're a small enterprise right we're north of a thousand staff globally and at that point you really 
you know, small changes, the butterfly effect, that like you really can see this ripple of, of change happen in a positive way. And so I suppose that's the most rewarding thing so far is making small adjustments and seeing big change. Fantastic. Debbie, I want to flip it to you because um, it's not every day that someone gets to work with a global chief people officer that perhaps hasn't worked too long in the HR function. Mm -hmm. How have you found it working with Rob with so much commercial experience, but perhaps less sort of HR and people experience? How's that been for you? Um, it is amazing for a couple of reasons, actually. I, and I think I should just acknowledge the it was a really brave move for Rob. And I remember when you were talking about it, I was like, oh, I don't know where this has happened before. But the amazing thing is we have a seat at the table because of where Rob's been on the journey before. And so often in so many other corporations, you hear the phrase, HR need a seat at the table. Well, we have that and we have somebody with a proven track record at CEO level. So that that's really kind of listened to. Um, I think it also makes a statement and I've already had feedback from people that we talk to, senior people coming into the business that goes, okay, you've got a CEO who's who's been appointed a CPO um, wow, that means the people agenda is really important to you. And yes, it is. So it's really amazing. I feel really lucky, though. I, we've worked together as a team now for six years. So um, I'm really fortunate. I'm, I'm grateful for your experience. I'm very grateful for today. I'm grateful <laughs> for Chloe's experience because with her marketing background, recruitment is a massive and talent is a massive subject. And that marketing attraction piece is is a massive function in its own right. So we've got a great blend of kind of CEO skills, marketing skills, recruitment expertise. Um, so it's um, it works really, really well. But I think the other thing that has really struck me in Whole Pack's eight journey was um, we have to congratulate our M and A people for the values matching that they did at the front end. You hear so many stories about American companies taking over European companies and it it being you know really bumpy. Um, but Pax8 were so good at the front end. They stood back. They, they matched the values first, obviously the commercial things as well, but they stood back and they let people find each other and they, they, they let the dust settle a bit. And then we've taken so many initiatives from here in EMEA and, and exported those back to the US. Um, and we've got lots of other stuff that we're doing together, but that's, that's because very much we've got that voice over there, um, as well with the, with a C-level person in a CPO seat. So it's great. Fantastic. What's your take on it? After six years working in <laughs> what seems like you've got all of the complementary business functions that just live in the HR, which is just so cool. It must be so energizing to work here every day. It is amazing. And actually, we don't call it HR. We just call it people um, because I don't think you should ever consider your team resources. They're human beings. Um, and I do think uh, to the points Rob and Debbie have made that the future of a fantastic people organization is bringing that diversity of skill set together because it is, it's a little bit operations, is a little bit marketing, is a lot leadership and culture and empathy and understanding, um, you know, and it's definitely needs a good dose of commercial acumen as well. So I do think the future is a more diverse team and pulling from those backgrounds. And I think to Rob's prediction that we will see that more because people are waking up to the fact that you can have the best IP in the world, the most innovative idea, the best product to market fit. But if you've not got a team of fantastic people who believe in what you're doing and want to show up every day to give it their all, you're not going to reach your full potential. Completely agree. Chloe, I know that Pax8 have a real commitment towards the and I am. Particularly, it seems like this is a passion project for you and getting more women into tech. Tell me a little bit about some of the strategies that you've implemented to make sure that, you know, there is an abundance of women working at Pax8 um, and, you know, representing that technology sector. Well, I really have to give full credit to Debbie for a lot of the work that she and her team do, because it starts, it starts at the front. It starts uh, by not just fishing in the usual places for talent. It's, you know, as I always say, if you want to get a diverse group of friends, you have to start hanging out at different parties. And it's exactly the same with recruiting diverse talent. You can't just 
put a job ad up on Indeed and suddenly expect people who may not think tech is for them to suddenly apply. Um, and Debbie's team do a wonderful job with how they write their job adverts. They really get under the skin of what does the candidate want? Not, not what does they want, that doesn't matter. It's what do candidates want? And how can we make them feel that this is a place, not only will that they'll be included, but they'll actually belong and they'll have a career where they will fly. Um, so really full kudos to Debbie and her team. We work really closely on this. And, you know, we, we do quite a lot of volume hiring. And so we only really consider a class of success if we have a good mix of, of candidates, uh, you know, male, female and different diverse backgrounds, you know, ethnic backgrounds. But also we really try hard not to limit to say, oh, you have to have a degree to work in technology. We hire smart people and we invest really heavily we have our own internal learning and development team. We have fantastic sales trainers. So anyone from any background could come and have a sales career here if they show the right aptitude for it. Um, and the other thing really, it flourishes from individuals. We have an amazing um, women empowerment group in the UK, also one in the US as well. That wasn't me setting that up. That was one of our amazing, uh, at the time she was a CGS, she's since been elevated to be a channel account manager, Lucy Hutchinson. She came to me and said, they do this in the US, I really want to do it here. How do I do it? I'm like, well, you just invite people and start and you need budget, we've got budget. So I think a really important part of the diversity agenda is not for us to appropriate groups that aren't ours. It's to support them and you know, fund them is really important. You've got to put your money where your mouth is, but also give them space and let people feel like they don't have to ask permission to have these conversations in the organization. I was really impressed the other week that uh, Chris Blackwood, one of our uh, amazing uh, cloud generation specialist entry role, has started having conversations about racial diversity in the pod stand-ups. Now, that wasn't something we asked him to do. He took that upon himself because it's important to him and he felt safe enough that he could do that at Pax8, which really just warms my heart. Amongst all of you, it seems like building that sense of psychological safety for the employees is so important for them to talk out. Your role is obviously really important in that because obviously that's from the very first moment you want people to be comfortable and have that sense of belonging to be confident enough to speak up. How are you doing that? It all stems back to their first stage interview and actually we build it into the job ad. When we talk to um, people considering joining us, we take them on a story about their life. We get them to tell us a story about where they've come from. Um, and as a leadership team as well, um, we've had some phenomenal psychological safety training. It's interesting because with people coming into the organization and with some of the leadership training that we've done as well, I see fear in both of those camps and all of those camps. So we've had some fantastic, vulnerable leadership training that is cascading right the way through the organization um, that gives people the opportunity to feel safe even when they're making mistakes. I'll give you an example. I, I made a mistake last month. I had the award for the um, crashed and burned. The judicious, judicious use of an emoji that I thought was a pointy finger, but it was actually the bird. Um, and <laughs> It went across the whole channel and, you know, I held my hand up and I went, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That was just the wrong thing to do. But I had such warmth back and laughter from the whole company around, I made a mistake, I fessed up and everybody was really fine. It could have gone really wrong in other cultures. Um, but celebrating those failures is something that I think we do really, really well, which makes people feel safe to try things new and push the boundaries. And, um, and I think that, again, that's why people join us, because they can do that. They're not join, joining another corporate where they're shoehorned into acting or behaving in a certain way. The way we interview pre people as well is we encourage them to bring their whole selves to work. We talk about where their grandfather or their father introduced them to their first piece of tech. We ask them what their first piece of tech was. All of those kind of things are breadcrumbs into the psychological safety that we provide when they get into the organization. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and it speaks to the, you know, the mold that our founder John set out, which is that, you know, he, he talks about it as servant leadership, which I think is something that 
doesn't get used very often. I've not bumped into that language in many other businesses. I think I think it probably sort of translates fairly easily in your mind into what it means. But this idea that leaders are here in service of their teams, not the other way around. Um, and, you know, another of his little catchphrases, you know, people always say, oh, it's not, oh, don't, it's not personal, it's business. He says it, it's business and it's personal, right? Like, of course, the two are intrinsically connected and you can't reasonably expect people not to be emotionally attached to the place they spend more time than anywhere else in their lives, right? So I, I think that, you know, that treating, treating people and, and culture as, as an absolutely necessary part of what makes a great workplace thrive is, you know, a big part of that, that approach that people see coming in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think people were a little bit skeptical, right? They sort of, oh, mm -hmm. but I mean, some of the feedback we get is, which is incredibly rewarding is people will say things like, oh, it's everything you said it would be, right? <laughs> um, and how, I don't think that's particularly common, right? Like a th recruitment is theater in most organizations. There's a little bit of that everywhere, of course. And we're I think, not perfect though, are we? No, no, of course not. Of course there's no not. perfect people and there's no perfect companies and we get it wrong and, and we go, oh, okay, but boy, we learn from it. Yeah. We but, pull it apart and put it back together and go, oh yeah, how do we avoid this again? But on the whole, you know, people that rock up, whether they've worked somewhere else before or not, um, yeah. Because, you know, again, bringing so many young people, I'm always cognizant that some people have no perspective. So they just think, oh, this is what works like. And I sort of, sometimes I think, wow, when you leave, you're going to have a real shock. Right? Um, but, you know, I think on the whole, people, you know, we deliver on our promise to people about psychological safety and what that means and the sort of workplace that we've created. So. I just love the fact the crash and burn award, I think if I was to come into PAX 8, that's an award that I'd want to win. <laughs> you know, just having that complete backing of everyone here that it's okay to fail yeah. and learn from that lesson. And I think that's so important that you've built that culture of trust and safety. So that is uh, something which I'm sure our audience is going to take on board and probably begin to implement, possibly steal and put that into their own company <laughs> culture. But I think that's a great thing. Rob, you've obviously been a part of PAX 8's massive growth trajectory, obviously taking over your previous organization, which is fantastic. What excites you, you know, the most about being at Pax8 and where, you know, the organization's heading? Because it must just be so fantastic to be a part of an organization that's just on a rocket ship right now. Wow, there's a lot there are a lot of different Big ways I can answer that question <laughs> because there's a lot to be excited about. Um I think fundamentally we are changing the way IT professionals all over the world buy cloud software. And that, on the face of it, is a kind of fairly bland mission. But I think when you really dig into what that means and what the businesses that we're, you know, we're enabling are, are doing with the software that they're buying and, and the way it's transforming their organizations and the impact that has on their customers and their end users, you don't have to look very far to see material improvement in people's lives right and their and their work and that's that's really exciting i think the the market we're in has been badly served for a long time right and and you know having this opportunity to 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 meaningfully enhance the experience that you know thousands and thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people are having um is pretty rewarding right so i think that's quite exciting because i can see that as we continue to grow and expand all over the world that's only going to ramp up and increase so that that's you know that's that's pretty compelling i think looking inwardly I, the thing that i remain incredibly excited about is just that we are genuinely creating a place where people enjoy the work that they do and the people they do it with and um, you know for me my north star throughout business has always been you know, prior to pax a and and since create an environment where people can do their best work do it with people who they respect and they enjoy spending time with you know trying to optimize for joy not for profit and um, you know i think this sort of conscious capitalism or conscientious capitalism movement as people refer to it is the future right and i think pax is a business that really really operates in that way where it's no longer just about shareholder return but you've got to think about planet you've got to think about you know your your employees and the three different stakeholders not just your shareholder right so um that is incredibly exciting to me building a truly progressive organization that you know will be an iconic company like it's pretty clear to those of us with impact say this is a name that a lot of people are going to know in the future um 
you know, whether we end up as a public company or not, you know, who knows. But like, Pax8 is going to be meaningfully bigger than it is today. And along the way is going to have the opportunity to positively impact a lot of lives. And that's something that I think is just really exciting. I suppose in HR or people, sorry, you get the opportunity to impact so many lives as well. Where do you see, you know, this rocket ship going in the future and especially looking after the EMEA zone, which seems like there's so much growth potential here. It must be a really exciting time to be the chief people officer. Yeah, I mean, there's huge potential in the European market and with the amazing, talented individuals who've chosen to come and join us. Um, for me, I, I absolutely agree with everything Rob says, like, you know, Pax8 is on to something and we're going to keep out innovating the competition, both in terms of our product and also the way we approach people. But for me, I, what I'm really excited about, the legacy, kind of building on the point Rob made, that a lot of our people who worked here may not have worked somewhere else before. But my hope is that by working at Pax8 and by being treated like adults and being told that their happiness at work is important, and their fulfillment is important, that if they do decide to leave, if they see an opportunity somewhere else, they will take that belief with them and they will spread it because all work should be a joy. We are so fortunate to live in such an advanced capitalist society. You know, most of us are lucky enough to not worry about putting food on our table and heating our homes at the moment. But so what's the next stage up? People shouldn't be miserable to live. So my hope is that whether people stay for a long time or they go somewhere else, they will take that Pax8 ethos about people as their right and they will push for that change elsewhere. The stay part is really important here, Debbie. And I know from working with many people and organizations, the tech sector is absolutely brutal in terms of attrition. Um, the turnover and the churn of employees is sky high, higher than any other um, industry. But it seems like Pax8 have done a really good job and in particular, sort of over the last two and a half years, as we sort of enter into the great reshuffle, you're still doing a great job retaining that great talent. How are you sort of keeping a motivated, a productive and an engaged workforce? Continuous, personal and professional development. It's not just about the professional development. Um, if, I, if I think about engineers, many of them want commercial knowledge, commercial insight to get better at interactions with customers, for example. Our um, internal learning platform, we've got something like 8,800 courses. We have vendors that come in and deliver training to our people. The people that we attract, their DNA is cut with continuous learning um, and this drive and this need to be curious all the time. And as long as they're learning, as long as we're giving them stretch projects, um, giving them access to other opportunities. And we're also now starting to coach our managers with, you may not be able to keep this person in this seat, so be generous, share them around the rest of the organization, leapfrog them from, from that division to that division. So the internal mobility piece at the moment that's running about 55% is really, really critical to retaining talent. And in other organizations, they other managers see that so much as a competition and they get really narky about it. But with our hiring managers, we have to we have to teach them, or with all of our managers, we have to teach them to be generous around the organization to keep that talent. It's like you've moved from talent hoarders to talent enablers. Yes. And it seems like that's really important. Do you think Rob's story enables um you know, giving that as an example, yeah, yeah. for example, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's really important to say, yeah. hey, you know, we can share the wealth of talent around mm -hmm. the organization and here's a shining light example. Yeah, he is. And we talk about, I, I, we coined the phrase about the, the Willy Wonka lift, wasn't it? It's like, it's not just about upward trajectory when you're moving, it's sideways. Sometimes you may want to take a step backwards. That's okay. Let's break that thinking about <sighs> the only way is up because it's not anymore. We're in the adaptive economy where we can do anything we want and go anywhere we want. So let's, let's maximize that if we can. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, just, I just add to that. I think the, the reality is we don't, we're not, well, we pay great wages. That's not what we're attracting people with. Right? Mm -hmm. I think if people come for a salary, they'll leave for one too. Yeah. And part of why our attention has been so good is because we're actually focusing more on the real substance of what makes a job a delight right it's it's autonomy mastery purpose it's the again these aren't new concepts this stuff's well-established leadership thinking 
Um, people often like to reference Simon Sinek. It wasn't his work. He made a lot of that stuff famous, right? But, um, you know, this if you give people the opportunity to learn new skills, right, mastery, to direct their own work with autonomy and have to have a purpose motive that they really can connect to, a meaning of the work, right, um, which for us is, you know, disrupting this industry in an incredibly positive way for our partners. I think as long as you're paying people enough to take money off the table, right, then all that other stuff is what actually matters. And, um, you know, we the feedback we get from others who are having huge churn problems is that they just haven't managed to fulfill their employees in those other ways. Um, so, yeah, I think it's about focusing on more than just a paycheck, right? It's, it's a big part of it for us as That's well. That's the number one thing that comes out, actually, 5,000 screens in the last two years. Uh, what motivates you is what we ask everyone. And the number one thing that comes out is I want to make an impact. I want to leave a legacy. I want to build. I want to create. Um, I want to be part of something special. Yeah. I, I want to be, be part of something that's going somewhere, right? Growth yeah. makes a lot of this a lot yeah. easier, yeah. Uh, you know, um, but... And that whole person yeah. thing, you know, it's not... We don't hire people for the skills on a job description. We hire the whole person and and you know where that person has come from in their in their life story so it's really really important and it's so interesting because the question i always ask people at some point if i'm meeting them for an interview is like so why are you leaving where you currently are to to take a chance on us and th that's the kind of realization everyone has it's like I'm sick of being treated like a cog in a machine. I want someone to notice if I don't show up and do my work that day. People are really looking for that, not just the contribution, but the community is such a key part of it. And I think especially after COVID, we've had this huge existential crisis. You know, there's been the swing of the pendulum from you mu most people had to work in an office to no one works in an office in tech. And now we're kind of finding our balance, but people People want that connection. Doesn't mean they want to be in the office every day, but they want connection with other people. Totally correct. I'm in a room with three extremely smart people. And what I want to find is when you sit around the table, maybe let me direct this at you. How do you deal with disagreement or how do you deal with generally difficult decisions that you may not generally see eye to eye, but you all know that you're coming from that best place possible to make the best decision for the business? and for the people. How do you do that? We start with positive intent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think we've sort of touched on some of this with the psychological safety discussion already. You know, the, um, you know, Amy Edmondson's thesis that everybody references, right? It, this idea of like what psychological safety an organization really gives you. For me, I always characterize it as the freedom to speak truth to power. It's like there is rank is not relevant when it comes to disagreement, in in my opinion. And that, I think we don't always get it right, but I think largely that's how it feels at Pax Eight. And so, um, you know, disagreement is encouraged, invited. Um, you know, it's almost sought out in some cases. Um, a, a dissenting view is is a valuable, diverse perspective, and it's something that. Um, you know, I think it, as leaders, if you demonstrate not only that you're open to that sort of feedback, that, but that you reward it, it's amazing how much of it comes forward, right? And I don't mean, look, deliberately attack every idea or pick holes in things, but... Um, Above the line and below the line. Yeah. Be curious. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the 15 commitments method is this thesis that if you're above the line, you're open, curious and committed to learning. If you're below the line, you're closed, defensive and committed to being right. And, you know, I think that staying in that above the line mode um, when you invite feedback from people and then whatever you do, thank them for the feedback you get or the dissenting view and tell them what you're going to do about it. Right. Show people the whole loop. So as a leader, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, look, I think the way you're doing this interview is really not great and you should do it in this different way. Right. You say, well, thanks very much. And actually, I'm, re you know, you get it like you, you can make sure you you're always appreciative of feedback whether it's positive or negative and um if you do take action you know show you're working like show people that the impact that it has and it's a you know, very small changes will create you know big results i think in terms of how people's behaviors will shift if you start to show up in that way and i think the key is 
people don't need you to go with their decision. They just need to be heard. They need to know that you care enough about them, that you listened with, with you know, real intent to listen, not just to persuade or to shut them down. Um, you know, we always say disagree, then commit. Um, that's something that is really important, as long as you hear from everyone. It's so important. I love what you said there as well, Rob. Um, we work with a fantastic coach called Chester Elton, and he always said, never ever say the words no, but because you can immediately crush someone's dreams. Just make sure you acknowledge and say yes and. And it's such a powerful, you know, change in your language that just makes a, a complete difference to the person that you're speaking to. And I think it's just so important just making those changes and just being subtly aware of those. Um, it can make a huge difference and I think probably plays back into your culture of why people are just so willing to experiment and be happy to fail knowing forward that they got the confidence in the backing of all of the employees saying it's okay to take that risk so i think that's brilliant i think awareness is great but habit building is yes. the key this stuff is easy to say it's harder to do and it's hard to do every single day consistently and we don't always get it right but i think that the you know the focus on building those habits and holding each other to account as leaders and you know holding you know, ask, making sure our teams hold us to account as well is really important. So awareness plus habit for me. Fantastic. And anything from you? Oh my goodness. 20 years in recruitment and I, there is not a day that goes by when I still don't feel like I need to learn more. Um, I think the pace of change that we're dealing with out there today is phenomenal. And yet the key for me is to put the human centric hiring at the heart of everything that we do and not lose sight of that. Debbie, I'm gonna ask you this question because perhaps you've worked in people a little bit longer than both Rob and Chloe. What is one thing you would change about the people function if you could literally just flick your fingers like that oh. and then suddenly make it a little bit better, a little bit easier or add more value. I, it, that's quite easy for me. And that's why I'm kind of grateful for both both of these guys. Um, and that is the cut and paste mentality in HR that goes on. Um, it, it, we're in a disruptive industry. OK, so now let's disrupt people ops HR. Um, we're in a massively changing world. You know, we've got Elon Musk building rockets for, for NASA. So, and yet we keep repeating the same corporate cycles in HR um, and cutting and pasting. And, and I think that's the one thing about our processes internally, when we exploded them and looked at the 160 different points of failure in the hiring process, and we put that back together. Um, it was a real wake up call for me that so many organizations out there have cut and paste initiatives across their entire hiring and onboarding spectrum. And they're all disconnected and they're all discombobulated. And that's why there's a massive problem out there um, within people or people. You mean, what, like the way job descriptions are written instead of job scorecards, things like that? Yeah, yeah, Is that like... yeah, all of that. And then the way, yeah, all of that and... Half hour capped interviews. Uh, that, yeah, I mean, oh my goodness, um, don't get me on that one. But that's like, you can't understand a person in a 40 minute phone screen. Um, you spend longer than that on Tinder these days, don't you? So, um, Do you? well, I don't, I, I've heard, <laughs> I kind of heard that. Rumor has it. Um, so, and if you can't spend an hour on the phone with a person, how can you expect them to perform and accelerate in productivity when they land? If you if you don't truly understand them, so that's are so many so many kind of areas there. So I think within the, within the whole HR community, I just encourage people to look at other industries, look at look outside of their industry, and don't just cut and paste one HR initiative from one company, slap it into your business, and think that it's going to work around all the other processes that you've got because it just doesn't. Um, and I, I so hope that we never become that corporate organization that where people feel that number and that cog. Um, and that's that's our challenge. I think that's the keeping challenge. Keeping it human. Keeping mean. it human and scaling it, um, but not turning into um, you know, a boring corporate organization um, in the treatment of people. Because uh, we can do things differently and better these days. I agree. 
Chloe, you're probably someone who's seen HR or people from an outside in perspective. Now you're in it. What's one thing that you'd love to change? Uh, I'd like to, I think people who work in HR often get a bad rap. Everyone I have interacted with uh, in the Pax8 People Org and in other places, they go into HR because they are committed and passionate about people and work being a joyful place. So I just want to put that on the record. Um, my pet hate is stupid rules and where you make rules for the lowest common denominator of behavior rather than treating people like adults. So, you know, sometimes you might see a sign which says, please do not skateboard down the stairs. And you're like, clearly sometimes one person did something stupid. <laughs> and now to solve that problem, someone in operations, legal HR has decided they need to put a sign up. Um, and I hate that mentality, you know, treat people like adults and they will respond in kind. Trust should be the basis of our principles. We're not, you know, this is not about tech security. This is about people. Trust should be at the heart of things. We should assume trust at all times and build policies that way. Fantastic. What about you, Rob? One thing I would change. Um, I think people like badly underestimate the value of A players in organizations. I think that People talk about talent density sometimes, or at least smart people do. Um, I think, you know, McKinsey did some work and they found that an A player, as they defined it, was 10 to 100x as productive as a B player, right? In an opening. If you accept that that is true, spending an hour and a half, not half an hour on an interview, so you make sure you get A players, is clearly commercially the right decision. And so in HR, I sort of see, in certainly in larger organizations, it's more common, but it's true even in small companies. There's just this like really obvious disconnect between the right commercial decisions and the decisions people make. And so um, I think that's the thing that I would change about the world of people in HR is like being just considerably more mindful of the real value of talent, like what great members of organizations actually deliver because it's a force multiplier and a completely exponential and not just in engineering style roles because I think that the conventional wisdom is oh yeah you know a developer can can produce way more output if they're of a higher quality but it's true in all roles in my opinion um so yeah if I had to pick one thing it would be that it would just be like re like completely reimagining the way people think about talent density in organizations and and building their whole process around that. Like how do we attract, retain, nurture the best talent? And hire above the mean average yeah. as we go along. Absolutely. So that the, the average gets higher and higher and higher, the bar gets higher and higher and we lift that. Yeah. Um, that I can't coin that um, phrase, but that was Bavin Tarakia, I think, an um, Indian entrepreneur. Um, he kind of said, if I had to hire for a job at my own company today, I don't think I'd get in, <laughs> which is kind of amusing. Yeah. And if that is ever true, you've done something very right. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're Can on that. Well, um, I just want to leave you with one final question. It's clear that you're all passionate about the people function and making a huge difference to all of the employees globally here at Pax8. It's clear that you all are deeply passionate and connected to the organization and its goals and its motives. What's one thing that you love most about Pax8? Just one. It's, it's really difficult. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you think, though. The thing I love most about Pax8, the genuine community. We're very lucky to have abundance problems, but it's the, you know, we could be really successful and no one like each other and just be out for themselves. And we could have a great P&L on the back of that. Many businesses do. But the fact that everyone here shows up every day, not just for themselves, but for each other, is truly special. Amazing. How about yourself, Debbie? Because I'm a bit of a maverick, the fact that we're allowed to rip up the rule book and think differently, I think that's the thing that most excites me for everybody in the organization, but especially me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's always hard to pick one thing, isn't it? Opportunity, opportunity for our people, for our partners. I think Pax8 is just having such a meaningful impact in so many people's lives. And I think that's, as I've sort of mentioned before, I just think that's something that 
is a really exciting thing to be part of. And you can look outwardly at the market and the impact it's having, or you look inwardly at the people around you and you know the fact that our like global chief commerce officer started on the sales floor five years ago and like you know seeing those really significant shifts people are able to make in their lives for the better as a result of Pax8 existing is something that is just incredibly rewarding and um, a, a source of great personal joy. So it'll probably be that. Amazing. Work at Pax8. Seems like you're hiring. We are hiring. <laughs> always hiring. Yeah. Even always hiring. And you're on the hunt for great talent. So yeah. fantastic. Well, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for today's interview. Honestly, it was fascinating to learn a little bit more about Pax8. Wonderful to learn a little bit more about yourselves as well. So thank you for spending the time with us today. Really do appreciate it. Thanks, Shane.